Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutors Curious World STEM series, where we're a couple days away from the 4th of July and it's actually Canada Day today. So I think we've all got fireworks on our mind. And when you're watching fireworks, you're not just celebrating your country, you're celebrating chemistry. There's so much cool things about the chemistry of fireworks. And that's why we are thrilled to have science teacher extraordinaire, the most famous science teacher, maybe any kind of teacher in um, TikTok history, Phil Cook here to give us some demonstrations and experiments to show us how fireworks really work. We also have some other special guests I want to introduce here. Uh, we've got our crew from Curious World STEM, ca STEM Camp here at Varsity Tutors. Everybody want to say hello. Here's the Curious World STEM campers uh, who've been doing a bunch of science projects this summer with Varsity Tutors as part of Curious World STEM Club. If you want to join them, there's a link on your screen to, uh, to learn a little bit more for live studio audience opportunities like these and a whole bunch of fun all summer long. And so they're going to be helping us out here behind the scenes. Um, couple things for you. Obviously, we want to keep it super interactive. So you see there's a chat panel to the right of your screen if you're watching along at home. Phil's going to ask you some questions to find out predictions you have about what might explode, what colors things might turn as we learn about the chemistry of fireworks. Answer his questions there. If you have any questions throughout the class about fireworks, and we're sure you have some good ones, then throw those questions in the chat. And in the last 10 minutes or so, I'll interview Phil with your questions to be able to get you some answers. Also have a camera nearby. We're going to give everybody an opportunity in about 35 minutes to lean into the screen, get a selfie with Phil himself. And if you upload that to Instagram and tag Varsity Tutors and Phil Cook, you'll be entered to win an autographed lab coat, not unlike the way the one Phil's wearing right now, um, but also a free entry in Curious World STEM Camp. So you can uh, join all these curious learners from our crew here today. All right, with all that said, um, I think it's dark enough for the fireworks to begin. Uh, maybe that's, that's what we're always waiting for on the fourth, right? So let me turn it over to your teacher for today, Phil Cook. Thanks so much, Brian. Thanks for that introduction. And it was, it's so great to have all the Curious World STEM campers with us right now at the beginning as well. We're going to learn all about fireworks today. I'm going to take you through kind of the basics of how we make them and the colors that we tend to, how we produce colors. And I'm going to show this to you. One of the best things about chemistry is being able to actually see what's being described to you. So my goal through our agenda today is to let you experience it and not just hear me describe it. So we've broken up this class into a few sections. And I just want to go over the agenda briefly with you. The first thing is I just want to get you curious. Part of being a scientist is developing curiosity and then finding a way to explore it. So we're going to do that with a demonstration to kick things off. Then we're going to look at the chemistry of how explosives and propellants work. It has to do with something that I'm sure you probably heard of before, but we're going to wait until we get to that section. We're going to move on then to how we actually make fireworks of a particular color. And then there's a grand finale. So I hope you're taking mental notes as we go through the first three sections. Finally, we're gonna end up with a little bit of Q&A and time to take a selfie. So it's gonna be a great class. I hope you guys are strapped in and ready to learn. So I wanna just start by showing you something. And I'm gonna to have to, throughout the course of our class today, switch camera views. Now I'll do my best to kind of tell you when I'm gonna do this. But the first is just a demonstration that I'm gonna show you that's happening in my fume hood. Now my fume hood is right over here. It's a piece of safety equipment. And if you know anything about doing chemistry, you know that we have to be safe. So it's time to goggle up and do this first experiment. I just want you to watch and see if you can make some observations. So I'm gonna change the camera view now so that you can see into my fume hood. There we go. And I'm going to place a little dish here into my fume hood. And I'm gonna mix three different materials. So one of them is gray. The second is a white crystal. The third is also a white crystal. So I'm taking all three of those and I'm just going to mix them together now. Now notice nothing's happening. A lot of times in chemistry, when a reaction is possible, it still requires something called an activation energy, something to get it going. But surprisingly, in this case, it's not heat. I bet if you came to a fireworks class, you were expecting that I was going to have to light something on fire. But in this case, we're going to use something else, a little bit of water. So I'm going to add just a little bit of water to the middle. Watch what happens. A 
<laughs> did you see that? Now, a couple of things I'd like you to put in the chat. What did you observe? What did you notice? Put the answers, your observations in the chat there. Okay, so take a moment right now, wherever you are, and put your observations in the chat. Okay. So some of you are saying, oh yeah, I saw a fire. Okay, you saw a certain color. Uh, did anyone catch the particular color? Yeah, definitely some smoke. That's pretty common for most fireworks, isn't it? Good, okay, I saw gray, you saw fire. All right, Brian, can you go to the next slide? So I've actually got a question for you. What do you think actually happened based upon what you saw? Do you think it's A, that I lied, that wasn't water, I was actually pouring gasoline, which is also a colorless liquid, onto the mixture? Or do you think it's B, water mixed with salt to form an explosion? Do you think it was C, spontaneous combustion because it's so hot in the lab? Or do you think it's D, that zinc and ammonium nitrate reacted to become nitrogen, zinc oxide, and water? What do you think? Which of those answers do you think explains what happened or identifies what happened? Just put your answer in the chat. I'm seeing some answers coming in now. Some of you got it. All right. <laughs> it's, pretty much, it's pretty much a giveaway, isn't it? Yeah, definitely, it's definitely D. In this reaction, this is a, a unique reaction that's not really used in pyrotechnics as much as it is, it's used to ex explain kind of the role of a catalyst. Two things reacted in this particular reaction. Zinc and ammonium nitrate gave off some gas, which we couldn't see, zinc oxide and water, but you also noticed a lot of energy that's re that was released as well. Energy in the form of heat, which I can tell you I felt, and light, which hopefully you saw, and smoke. Those are all uh, carriers of energy. That third ingredient that I added, ammonium chloride, is something called a catalyst. And catalysts speed up reactions. And they do that by making the reaction easier to happen by lowering the activation energy. Big idea here. Metals and metal salts, in this case, the metal was zinc, can emit light when energy is involved, when they absorb energy. And pyrotechnics are always fast occurring chemical reactions. And don't forget that you guys can ask your questions as we go through any of these parts of the class today. And we might select your question for to bring up later on during the question and answer. So Brian, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And let's just review kind of what we've talked about so far in section one. If you're gonna make a firework, typically what we want is something that's gonna give us a color, whether it's a spark or a particular color of light an oxidizer, something that provides oxygen, a fuel, something that can burn, and then binders, something that will hold them together. Think about a sparkler. A sparkler has components held onto a metal stick that if those binders weren't there, all of the components would fall away. Sounds like we're about ready for section two, which is one of my favorites. How do we get those fireworks to shoot up into the sky? And how do we get them to explode? So what I thought it would be best to do is not just talk you through it, but show you. So what I'd like to do is talk to you about how we make fireworks explode, what makes them fly through the air, and then the difference between them. If you think about what most commonly is used in fireworks, you probably think about gunpowder or black powder. And I'd like to show you what black powder looks like and how it burns. And I wanna also show you about something else that can also be used as a propellant. So I'm gonna switch my camera view now so that you can see both. And I'm gonna do them one after the other because it's not safe for me to do them both simultaneously. So I'll make sure and explain to you which one's which as we go along. So I'm gonna switch my camera view now. We're back into the fume hood and it's been long enough now that this dish has completely cooled. So I'm gonna start by replacing it with a new dish. And inside that dish, I'm gonna place a little bit of black powder. Now black powder is made up of three simple things. Here's what it looks like. Black powder is made of charcoal, sulfur, and potassium nitrate. Only three things. So there's only three things in this mixture that I'm pouring into this dish right now. I'm gonna ignite it so that you can see what black powder looks like when it burns. So here we go. One, two, Three.
Isn't that cool? Really, really bright. But did you notice it didn't burn super fast? Gunpowder doesn't actually explode. Gunpowder just burns fairly rapidly. And there's lots of materials that can also burn fairly rapidly. I'm going to show you a second one. This second material, propellant material, looks really strange. I'm going to hold up a piece right here to the camera. This is two ingredients, potassium nitrate, which is also a component of black powder, and sugar, just regular old granulated sugar, combined together to make something called rocket candy. And I think you'll see why we call it rocket candy here in a second. So watch what happens this time and see if you can compare how those two materials are the same and how they're different. Yeah, it does kind of look like cheese. I see that in the comments. It does kind of. Uh, it's kind of an off-white color. So we're going to light it now in three, two, one. Now, I don't know if you noticed that, but it burned away to almost nothing. And that's really, really important when we're talking about a propellant. We want that propellant to burn away completely and make something in the process. It's something that's true for any propellant or any explosive for that matter, okay? So, Brian, let's go to the next slide. I wanna see if you can identify some things because one thing that was the same for both of these processes is, did you notice they produced a lot of smoke? That's all a lot of hot gas. And that's really what's going to be responsible for pushing our firework up into the sky so that it can then explode later on. And it's that same gas that causes the explosion. The only difference is, in one case, you're letting the gas escape. That's where we would use it as a propellant. In the other case, you have to confine the gas. And that's what causes it to explode because that gas exerts a lot of pressure. So let's see how good you are at identifying gases. For burning black powder, the chemical equation is up on the slide right now. What are the two gases that are produced by that reaction? Can you identify them? Type the formulas or the names if you know them. Type the formulas into the chat and see if you can identify the two gases. So out of everything that you see there, only two of them are gases. It's okay if you're not sure, you can always take a guess. I will tell you that everything on the left-hand side of that equation are gonna be what we started with. I see some answers coming in now. All right, good, I see lots of answers coming in now. Very good, lots of reasonable guesses. All right, good, a lot of you got it. A lot of you got it, or you at least got part of it. You identified one of the two, if not both. And the reality is that this equation that I'm showing you here is a generalized equation. There are lots of byproducts that could form, but the two from this specific equation that are, are gases, are carbon dioxide, that's CO2, and nitrogen gas, that's N2. So out of everything that's listed there, it's those last two formulas that are the gases that are responsible for the gas that we saw. All right, Brian, can you go to the next slide? Because I think we're about ready to talk about um, what we would have to do if we wanted to use gunpowder based upon what you've seen. Okay, so just remember that gunpowder burns really, really hot and it burns fast but not too fast. And the gas, because it's hot, expands. And that can be used for either explosions or propulsion. So I want you to put in the chat, what do you think we would need to do? So say we wanted a firework to launch safely away from us up into the sky. What do you think we would have to do? How would we have to direct those gases? What do you think we would have to do? Go ahead and put, the, put your answers in the chat and let's see Let's see what kind of answers you're coming up with. Okay, good, yeah, definitely. I see that pointing the gas downward, right? You'd have to point the gas downward. Yeah, absolutely, that's exactly right. Or you have to contain the gas. I see the other comments there, containing the gas. The big idea here is if you want that firework to go up and away from you, the gas has to be directed downward. This is a part of physics that we would call Newton's third law, which for every action, in this case, the action of the gas being pushed this way, there's an equal but opposite reaction, which is the gas 
the, the effect of the gas pushing this way, having the effect of the object or the projectile being forced in the opposite direction. So if we wanted to use rocket candy, we'd have to put it at the bottom and we'd have to give it a way to escape. So just in summary, for propellants and explosives, Explosions are just caused by rapidly expanding gases, specifically if we confined everything. Like a firecracker is nothing more than a bit of gunpowder in a sealed paper container. So the gas has nowhere to go, and the result is it explodes because it so rapidly expands. So it causes the paper container to burst open. If we want to use that same chemical to launch a rocket up, we have to direct the expanding gases down. So the idea is an action and a reaction mode of thinking. And explosions are really just rapidly occurring chemical reactions. Both of the materials that I showed you could be used as propellants or they could be used to cause an explosion in a different proportion. I think we're ready for section three, which is my favorite. The chemistry of how we make fireworks a particular color. So what I want us to think about is what compounds give firework their colors? And how do we actually obtain the exact color that we want? And then how does this process even work? So let's start with going through a little bit of testing what you know already. So when you see a firework light up in the sky in colors and give off different colors, what part of the atom do you think is causing that color that we see? Put the answer that matches what you think is the component of the atom that causes the color that we see. Is it the proton, the neutron, or the electron? I see some answers coming in now. I see, I see some protons. I also see a lot of electrons. Okay, I see lots. Some of you are typing it out. Some of you are putting in answer choice C. There is a lot of people saying electrons. And you're exactly right. Brian, can you go to that next slide? I want to explain to you exactly how this process happens. And then I want to show it to you. The idea here is we have to have an atom or a particle where there's energy being absorbed. And when the electron in the atom absorbs energy, it jumps to a higher energy level, what we call an excited state. So that's in that image on the left where you see that little blue negative particle, that's the electron. When it falls back down to the ground state, it has to let go of that energy that it's obtained. And it does that in the form of light. And another word that scientists use for describing particles of light is a photon. Depending on where the electron falls, that gives us the particular color of light that we'll see. So I want you to keep that in mind as I go through and show you some things. Because uh, Brian, can you actually go back to the, the main camera here? Because I want to show you guys. I want to show you four different materials that we can commonly use to give us a particular color. So I wanna show them to you first, and then I'm gonna switch the camera view and demonstrate them for you. So these are the four materials. I put them in test tubes, and I've just put small samples of them in there. You might notice that they're all white crystalline materials, except for this last one. This last one has a very vibrant blue-green color. Now, what I'm going to do is something called a flame test, which means I'm going to ignite a Bunsen burner, and then I'm going to place a small sample of each of these materials into the flame. Your job, pay attention and make note of what colors that you see. Okay, so that's your job. Make sure you pay attention to what colors you see. And we're going to be using a Bunsen burner. So again, safety first. We got to goggle up for this one. So I'm going to switch the camera view, and then we're going to go back into the fume hood where it's safe to do these types of experiments. Okay, I'm gonna move our previous experiment materials out of the way. They're cooled off now where I can handle them. I'm gonna place each of these in the backdrop so that we can see them. And I'm gonna move in a burner. Now, this burner is a special burner. It's called a Meeker burner. A Meeker burner is like a Bunsen burner it just gives us a nice wide blue flame. So here I'm gonna ignite the Meeker burner. Notice how you probably can't even see that it's burning, which is good because we wanna be able to tell the color of, of the material and not have the flame influence that. So the first one we're gonna do is a sample. We're gonna take some 
strontium, some strontium ions. So I'm gonna dip this in into my sample. Notice how it sticks. It sticks to my little wooden splint. So now pay attention as I put this into the Bunsen burner or the Meeker burner flame. What color do you see? Now, I, it's hard for me to tell by looking at the monitor, but I can tell you with my eyes, I see orange, red, a very vibrant orange red color. So that's strontium. Yeah, good. Okay, you guys can see it too. I see it in the chat. Yeah, we're seeing lots of good red colors. Next, we're going to move to calcium. You probably heard of calcium before when you think of milk. So calcium is going to be next. We're going to take a small sample. Calcium, put it on our wooden splint. Here we go. What color do you see there? Type what color you see in the chat. Yeah, orange, orange. Calcium gives us that orange color. Next, we're gonna move into barium. So barium is next, get a small sample of barium. So I've got just a small sample on there. Here we go. Watch barium and tell me what color you see. This one can be difficult. Yeah, is it green? That's right, Jaden, it is green. I see a couple of you putting that in the chat. Absolutely, that's green. It's a, it's a little bit of a yellow green. So it's not a very vibrant green, but it's got a little tinge of green to it. Our last one is going to be copper. So we're going to do copper as our last one. And that's the one that has this pretty blue-green crystal there. Check this one out. This one's my favorite. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I swear I could do this all day and just look at this one. So that gives us a nice, a nice color. Yeah, good. You guys are already ahead of me putting it in the chat. Absolutely. Blue. Isn't that cool? And you also get little sparks, too. Do you guys see little sparks with that? And now my wooden splint's catching on fire. <laughs> so those are four different ways, four different materials that we can use that all give us unique colors. Brian, go ahead and go to that next slide. So here's a question then. What if we don't want a particular color? What if we just want a sparkle? Put your answer in the chat. What do we do? It obviously can't be the same thing that we just did. So what do we do or what do we use if we want our fireworks to sparkle? Take a moment and put your, your best guess in the chat. Tell me what you think we would have to do if we want our firework to sparkle. That's a good, I, I, it's a good guess with gunpowder. I see somebody putting in gunpowder. Okay, a couple of people are saying, all right, a few are saying metals. Use some metals. Well, all of the materials we used just now were metals, but they were metal ions. Yeah, absolutely. Something that makes the color white, maybe some glitter. That's not a bad idea. So let's take a minute and let's actually try that suggestion for the metals. So I've got two metals here. We're going to try putting elements into the flame, metallic elements. So unlike our last examples, like this one, which is a compound, here we're just using an element. So the first element that I'm going to use is magnesium. Now magnesium, it's normally very silver in color, but when we grind it into a fine powder, it tends to have, take a little gray, gray color to it. Watch what happens when I sprinkle a little bit of this magnesium powder above our Meeker burner flame. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Did you see that? If you saw it, tell me what you saw in the chat. I'm gonna do it one more time because the reaction happens so quickly. Watch again. I think my Bunsen burner went out. Let me relight that. There we go. All right, here we go, one more time. A little bit of magnesium right at the top. Did you see that? Yeah, sparks, we saw sparks. We actually saw very white sparks. Let me show you one final time, and then I want to try a different metal element. So adding magnesium would give us an option for really nice white sparks. I don't know if you guys noticed that all those sparks were very bright and white. 
Oh, I see a lot of you in the comments are saying, yeah, definitely white sparks. You saw lots of sparkle. Well, check out the difference when we change the metal. So we did magnesium. Now let's do iron. So we're gonna take some iron filings and we're gonna do the exact same thing. Watch what happens when we add a little bit of iron. That might actually look familiar to you because we use a lot of iron in common pyrotechnic fireworks. Watch again, and then put in the chat what you're seeing. Isn't that cool? <laughs> it looks, it reminds me just like sparklers that I used to have when I was a kid. Yeah, absolutely. I see in the comments too, you guys agree. Yeah, it looks like sparklers and definitely more sparks than magnesium, right? Let me show it to you one more time. It's just so pretty. It's like one of those things you could just do all day if you, if you had the chance. The sparks branch with iron. It's really pretty. We use iron as a lot of branching spark materials and pyrotechnics for fountains. So these things that tends to spray sparks up into the air. So if we want to make sparks, we just use metal elements. And if we want to make particular colors, we're going to end up using compounds. Now, oh, I need to turn my Bunsen burner off, my maker burner off. So a couple of things just, just to recap here before we get to a, a question. I wanna make sure that you understand the fundamental difference between what I showed you. At the beginning, when we wanted to have particular colors be developed, we used a compound and the compound contained a particular ion of a metal. And that didn't give us necessarily much sparks, did it? It just gave us a particular flame color. So if we wanted to have a mixture of colors, then you can imagine we would mix those particular materials together until we got the right composition of color. And then if we wanted sparks, instead of using a compound, we would use a metal element, typically ground very fine, like the, the magnesium powder or the iron powder that you saw me use, because that tends to give us either orange sparks, which iron gives us orange sparks, or white sparks, which is what magnesium gives us. And there's other metal elements we can use as well, uh, like aluminum or zinc that would give us different colors. I don't know if you remember, zinc was in the very first demonstration that I showed you, and it gave us kind of a blue-green uh, sparkly uh, output, which is pretty cool, one of my favorite things. So I've actually got a question for you, something that I want you to see if you can notice. These are the chemical formulas of the metal salts that you saw me use those four that are bulleted there. What do you notice that they all have in common? What's your answer in the chat? Now, there's no answer choice to choose here. You're gonna to have to type in what you notice that's the same. Yeah, you guys are smart. <laughs> you picked it up very quickly. You notice that they all have Cl and not just Cl, but they have two chlorines. That is pretty common because they all have the same charge. Those metal ions all have the same charge. So they're going to form a, a compound with the same number of chloride ions. There's actually a reason why we use chlorides salts, chloride salts in fireworks. And that has to do with the fact that chlorine ions enhance the color that we tend to get out of uh, a particular metal salt. And just so you know, when I say metal salt, I mean that compound. Okay, that's called a metal salt because it contains a metal and a non-metal. In this case, they all contain chlorine, which you guys got that one. Nicely done. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, which I believe is our summary for section three. Big things to remember here. It's all about electrons. Electrons produce light and they only produce light. Remember this, when you take chemistry class in high school, your, your chemistry teacher will likely ask you, how does an atom emit light? Just remember, when an electron falls from an excited state to the ground state, it emits energy in the form of light. So the big idea here is it's all about electrons. So those fireworks that you see in the backdrop of this slide are just billions and billions of atoms whose electrons are falling to the ground state and releasing energy in the form of light. I bet you could probably pick out a couple of different elements that are probably in there from the colors that you see. And notice the sparks at the base as well. I bet there's some elemental metals involved in there. Big idea here also, metal ions have different electron structures. That's what leads to them emitting different light, different colors of light. And chlorides enhance the production of light. It's a very common component. 
And remember that we used ammonium chloride in our first experiment as a catalyst. Chloride ions are commonly used to enhance the light output of a pyrotechnic, of a firework. Right? Yeah, definitely. I see some of you in the chat, you're trying to hypothesize what could be at the bottom of those fireworks. It could very well be iron. It could also be aluminum. Aluminum and iron look very similar. And I didn't demonstrate aluminum for you, but they look very similar. I think we're ready for section four, which is your turn to tell me what you've learned. I'm going to set up here just a moment, but I want you to look at this slide for just a second while I'm getting things set up. I'm gonna show you three different rockets. And I want you to make a prediction as to which of the material, which of the rockets is going to be a rocket that gives off sparks. I right, put your answer in the chat and I'm not gonna reveal it yet because I'm just gonna show you. And then you're gonna be able to see exactly which one will emit sparks. So I'm gonna show you three rockets. We're gonna light them all. And I want you to make a prediction as to which rocket is gonna actually emit some sparks. I see answers all over the board, but I see a lot of people thinking that it's B. Well, we're gonna find out here momentarily. I just need a second to get my meeker burner out of the way and move the apparatus into the camera view. Okay. Now, hopefully you've had enough time to make your prediction. So I'm gonna switch the camera view. And when you see me switch the camera view, you're gonna see three rockets. They're in the exact same order as what you saw on the previous slide. Now, this reaction, if something goes wrong, it's gonna be okay, right? Because sometimes reactions don't go the right way, uh, but we're gonna be safe as we do this. So whenever you see me do something like this, it's in a fume hood, it's safe. And I'm always wearing those safety glasses because safety is, has to come first. You wanna be able to enjoy the chemistry and be able to explain it to your friends afterwards and not have to deal with getting a burn or anything like that. So I'm gonna switch the camera view and we're going to take a look at the setup, make sure we can see everything. So there are my three rockets. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna light them one at a time. And we're gonna see if you made the right prediction. All right, so here's the first one. This was answer choice A. So this has gunpowder with some strontium chloride in it. So here's the first one. I didn't see any sparks on that one. Now here's B. This is gunpowder with some magnesium in it. Look at those sparks. The only difference there, oh, that's just cool. <laughs> the only difference is the presence of that metal element. Finally, we've got one that's got rocket candy in it. Okay, that sugar and, and potassium nitrate mixed together. So here's that final one. I don't know about you, but I saw a few sparks there. But definitely the giveaway in this case was B. Having a presence of a metal mixed in with that gunpowder gave us a beautiful shower of sparks. So if you imagine if you wanted a rocket to fire up into the sky, you could use gunpowder to propel it and magnesium to leave a beautiful trail of sparks as you did, as you watched it go up into the sky. How cool is that? So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. I hope you guys did pretty well. Uh, I wanna actually take a minute and we found this graphic of a cutaway of a traditional 4th of July firework, or actually you could use it for all kinds of things, I suppose, whatever you're celebrating, where you wanna use fireworks to celebrate. But I wanted to talk you through a couple of things here because you're gonna see a lot that has to do with exactly what we talked about over the course of this, this class. I want you to pay attention at the very bottom where you see the person's hand. Notice how there is a bunch of black material. And that black material, it's colored green, which means it's a propellant. That's the charge that would initially lift that firework up into the sky. It would burn very quickly. It would produce lots of hot expanding gas and push that shell up into the sky. But then notice what happens. In the middle, it looks like there's two black lines connected to the core. That core contains additional gunpowder, 
along with other materials that might give you a particular color. But in this case, that's an explosive charge because notice there's nowhere, there's no place for the gases to go. They're gonna be confined. So once the fire reaches the center, it explodes. And as it explodes, it ignites all of those little balls of different chemicals. In this case, those, those balls are gonna be composed of metals if we wanted sparks and metal salts if we wanted colors. So this is what a firework looks like on the inside for something that shoots up into the sky explodes and gives you all kinds of different starburst patterns or whatever pattern that you're looking for. The colors are going to be determined by the metal salt and the uh, sparks are going to be determined by the presence of metals. That is just, that is just cool. It's a lot of complicated chemistry and you can imagine it takes a craftsman to be able to make something like this. These are not easy fireworks to make. Definitely something that's beyond my, my level of skill right now. So I hope you guys had fun with this and I hope you've actually been putting your questions in the chat as well because I think what we're gonna be doing next is moving on into uh, an opportunity for you guys to take a selfie and ask some questions. Uh, Brian, what, what's, the, what's, what's up next? All right, sequence of events. Let's uh, let's get to it. So yeah, um, next up is uh, one. Please keep your questions coming. It has been so fun watching all of these questions come in. So let's make sure uh, you guys keep all of your questions coming in. Uh, but for the moment, uh, we want to give everybody an opportunity to lean into the screen and uh, and get a picture with uh, with Phil, the the man, the myth, the legend, El Cochinero, <laughs> uh, on the uh, on the lab coat there, which you can explain in a second. Uh, remember, as you guys are getting lined up for the perfect photo, uh, if you've got goggles you're free to goggle up for this as well because that's oh, how yes, science definitely. is that much more fun. Um, if you upload these to Instagram after class, we'll have the official handles for Phil Cook, which is just a sign. No, uh, Chem Teacher Phil. We've uh, yeah. we've updated. We got the, yep. the um, you know the right one there. So uh, we'll have the official handles up there so you guys know exactly who to tag. You'll be entered to win an autographed lab coat so you can look as uh, as, as cool as uh, as Phil and you're, you're safe for a lot of your experiments and a spot in uh, Curious World STEM Club. So I think I've given you enough time to get those cameras ready. So let me turn it back over to Phil and uh, let's get those pictures. Great. Okay, so the way that this is gonna work, you guys, make sure that you've got your camera, or your iPad, whatever you're using to take your photo. I'm gonna freeze frame. And for this one, I'm just going to hold my torch up because the torch was the center stage for this particular class. So hopefully you guys are all ready. We'll do this a few times to give you an opportunity to get a good photo. And don't forget to tag Varsity Tutors and tag at Chem Teacher Phil. I would want a lab coat. I, I, I want a lab coat that says Varsity Tutors actually and, and, says, and says Chem Teacher Phil on it. Uh, maybe I'll win something in the future. Who knows? <laughs> All right, here we go, you guys. So ready? One, two, three. Okay. Hopefully you guys had a chance to get that. I'm gonna actually switch props. I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab a couple of the salt flags that I use in case you like that better. And let's see. Oh, my favorite one. I like the strontium one. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold it up like this. Okay, here we go. We're gonna do this one on three as well. Ready? One, two, three. Okay, great. Hopefully you guys got great photos. Don't forget, tag Varsity Tutors, tag Chem Teacher Phil. I can't wait to see the photos that you guys uh, tag us in. It's always so much fun. To be able yeah, to it's always them. a highlight of these classes. So, um, yeah. so uh, yeah, get those pictures up there. Again, we'll have the official handles up on a slide on the way out. Uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about Curious World STEM Camp uh, or just enroll, there can only be one winner. But as you saw at the beginning, there can be hundreds of, uh, of delighted uh, tinkerers, chemists, and, uh, and other scientists. Um, they'll click the link on your screen. You'll learn more. And uh, we hope to see you this summer. And I don't feel we'll be coming back. We'll be doing more live studio audience kind of things. Speaking of the live studio audience, uh, we've got some folks standing by to, uh, to answer some questions. We'll also get some uh, from the folks at home. Um, I think maybe some parents have been asking questions as well, Phil. I have this same question. Let's start with, we talked about the fun of fireworks. You showed us some cool experiments, but let's, let's talk a little bit about safety. Um, what's your advice for, for firework safety? What should people know, uh, you know, before they, they you know, kind of get into the, you know, we, we know a little bit about the chemistry, but it's kind of that phrase, we know a little, you know, enough to be dangerous. 
Tell us a little bit about firework safety. You actually have to be very, very careful with fireworks, any kind of pyrotechnic composition. So that, that big word just means anything that's gonna burn quickly, producing lots of hot gases, sparks and flames, that type of thing. When everything that you saw me use today, if I had to mix a composition, I did it outside because it's never safe to mix these components inside. Because you can imagine if a, if a spark, if a single spark hits that composition, it can immediately catch the whole sample on fire. And that can be a very dangerous situation. So we have to be very, very careful about the way we mix these chemicals and actually how we store them as well. I only ever make enough that I'm gonna use in a particular demonstration. So when in doubt, just leave it to the experts. And if you don't have an, if you, if you don't have an expert around, you really shouldn't try it. That would be my advice. Uh, or have an expert work with you. If you have somebody who can lead you and show you how to do it safely in an environment, then it's okay to do it. But other than that, we have to be very, very careful. You always expect that something might go wrong and you plan accordingly. Perfect. Thank you. Even when we were talking about, you know, before class, even with the experts, there's that video that went viral yesterday of, uh, you know, police department confiscating illegal fireworks, mm -hmm. trying to detonate some, and even they had a little bit of trouble with it. And, uh, and it was a bigger explosion than they were ready for. So please be careful. They're great to watch and understand the chemistry of, but have an expert a grown up around, uh, around you, uh, whether you're watching them or, you know, especially if you, you want to put a little bit of what you learned to use, make sure you've got uh, a grown up who knows what they're doing nearby. Uh, we've got a question from our studio audience here. Um, Savannah, you've been asking some great questions um, throughout. So let's, uh, let's get you on screen. And uh, what's your question for Phil? So some fireworks ex are shaped like a smiley face when they explode. How is that possible? That's a great question. So if you, if you imagine to get a smiley face, you would want to have just certain parts of the inside to be the parts that lit up and gave you the eyes and lit up and gave you the mouth. And you have to pack them around that center charge that's gonna explode so that they fly out at just the right location so that the eyes are in the right spot and the mouth is in the right spot. So it's really a matter of taking a normal firework that has lots of individual components that each would give you like a starburst and replacing those with only certain ones that give you a certain color. So that's a great question. And I think if, if I actually had access to someone who built these, they would be able to tell you the detail behind that. But most of those smiley face fireworks, at least the ones I've seen, it's very common to see a red, like a red ring around the face and then like yellow, yellow eyes and a yellow mouth or the opposite. You tend to see a red eyes and a red mouth and then a ring encapsulating it. That just tells you that the interior ring has two little balls of chemicals that are gonna be the eyes. And then below that, a ring of balls that will be the mouth. And then outside of that, an entire circle of chemical balls that are going to give you that ring. And they just, as soon as that explosion happens, they all get pushed out and lit on fire at the same time. And our eyes see it like a smiley face. Do you ever notice that sometimes it looks kind of like upside down? That's all because of the way that it, that it ignites. So great question, wonderful. Yeah, I love that one. That was an, an um, phenomenal, um, you know, uh, like explanation too. I mean, it was just really cool to think about how they package that together and the different chemicals. And, uh, yeah. you know, it, it, so it gives us something to look out for um, coming up this weekend. Um, hey, another one that, uh, that came up a few times from a lot of people um, out there, and thanks to all of you for all of your questions. Um, you know, we, we know the fireworks can be noisy, uh, especially, you know, any, anyone with dogs kind of knows that uh, this time of year as well. What makes the noise? We know we've got rapidly expanding gas. Uh, that kind of causes the explosion. We, we know about the colors and the sparks. What causes the noise? Yeah, it's exactly the rapidly expanding gas. That's exactly what it is. I mean, I think if you, if you imagine, you saw several demonstrations today that I did where you could hear the gas. You could probably just hear that whoosh. Now imagine you can find that like a balloon popping. It's very much the same. You get, you get this expansion piece and then you get a rupturing of the material. And that just promote that just gives you all of that sound. Um, that's that's what I understand about it at least. So the rapidly expanding gases make all that noise. 
Yeah, that's it's pretty amazing to uh, to think about how you know, we saw you know even with a little bit of the rocket game to the gunpowder how how quickly those gases explode and we hadn't you know tightened them up at all so it makes uh, makes total sense and um, you yeah, experience it all you. the time when you make when you make popcorn you make popcorn at home what that really is is steam inside the kernel of a corn of corn getting so great in pressure that the husk can no longer contain it and it explodes and that pop that you hear is the steam rapidly expanding. It's not really much different than that. Now that's a fireworks experiment we can all do at home. So that's Absolutely. perfect. We're talking about safety and, and some of this stuff, you know, we don't want to get too close to, but that one, we can experience the wonder of, uh, of uh, rapidly expanding gas and then, you know, get to enjoy it in uh, as a snack as well. So awesome. Thank you. Hey, uh, Ribby has got another great question for you here. So I want to get her up on screen. She's one of the Curious World STEM campers. So um, yeah, I want to ask your question. Awesome. Let's hear it. If you mixed all of the colors together, Okay, I think you said what would what would happen if you mixed all of the colors together? That's a great question. It really depends. Now, if you imagine if we took all of the chemicals that you saw me use, so we had a red, we had an orange, we had a yellow, we had a green, and we had a blue. All of those colors would mix together in front of our eyes, and our eyes would tend to see it as white because white is a mixture of all of the colors of the visible spectrum together. So what you would probably see is some color of white. Uh, if you tended to see one color dominate, that just means that you had a little bit more of one material than another. Great question. Oh yeah, you probably see white. Nice. Thank you. That's, um, yeah, that, that, Story checks out and, and the, the explanation is, is fantastic there. Hey, one that's come up a ton from, uh, from the folks at home, especially because uh, I think everyone's held a sparkler at one point or another. So when you're talking about sparks, uh, you know, with metals and, uh, you know, metal elements and, and binders and all that, you know, that was kind of an easy thing to visualize. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what's the difference between sparklers and fireworks? Kind of how are they put together differently? We know they have a lot of the same ingredients. Um, and, and actually, I'd probably challenge the, the crew at home. I think, uh, you know, that question came came up a lot early and a few times later. I think people may have some good answers on their own, but can you tell us a little bit about uh, while people make predictions, difference between fireworks and sparklers? So fireworks are spark, uh, sparklers are fireworks. Okay? Sparklers are a pyrotechnic composition. They're just not a propellant, right? So it doesn't have the same proportion of a material called an oxidizer that gives us oxygen and a fuel, but it still has all of those things. A very common sparkler uh, similar to the one that was used in our presentation, is going to have aluminum. That's why they tend to look silver. And the oxidizer can be many things. Often it's potassium chlorate or potassium perchlorate. That, you don't need to worry about the formula, but it's just that's the oxygen source. And then there's a fuel. And, and oftentimes the fuel is charcoal, right? charcoal, which is just carbon. And then there's going to be a binding agent. Typically we use dextrin as a binder. Think of it like a glue because you want it to stay on the stick. The right composition means it's going to be relatively easy to burn. The metal, like aluminum, would give off a shower of sparks, and it's not burning so quickly that you have to worry about it acting like a propellant. So that we mix the components in just the right ratio. Chemists are all about ratios and proportions. Just the right amount so that it burns, gives us the sparks that people want, but doesn't burn so quickly that it would act like a propellant. But fundamentally, it's the same, same composition. You got an oxidizer, a fuel, and then all of the color or spark producing agents that we talked about in this class. Again, you know, more, more fireworks experiments that some of us can do a little more safely from home. So um, that's, uh, that's really great to, to hear as well. Um, hey, one other one for you. So, so actually, I actually think Savannah's question kind of uh, led to it and people were sort of asking, there's, we've, we've seen a lot of cool advances in fireworks, right? Where they're so much more careful with colors and color blends. They're able to do shapes and mix sizes and everything. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any innovations that you want to see with fireworks or any challenges you have for young fireworks enthusiasts as they, you know, go off to college and grad school and, uh, and tinker with chemistry. Uh, what do you think is next in fireworks? Well, what I hope is next is that we start to think about uh, how it affects our air. Because I think when you're burning a lot of fireworks, some compositions can produce a lot of stuff that can be irritating. And a lot, a lot of times we don't worry about it. It's very, very high up in the air. 
Um, but I'd love to see some green, some environmentally friendly compositions that still give us the colors that we love and enjoy, and we can still use them to celebrate all the things that we want to celebrate, but do it in a better, more earth-friendly way. That's what I'd like to see. But the, the other challenge would be make a color that someone's never, never seen before. How many times have you seen purples, like real purples? Not very often. Think about the colors that you very rarely see in fireworks. Deep blues, very difficult to make. So go out and make those colors, right? Do something that's never been done before. The smiley face, I never saw it until I was kind of in my mid twenties. It was, it was amazing. Like who thought of that? Well, people very much like you who might be interested in chemistry and fireworks, you guys could come up with those types of things. So I, be creative. I love that. Let's, let's make some new colors out there, uh, but also make sure those new colors are green. Uh, as an eco-friendly, that's, uh, that's perfect. So you guys all have your marching orders out there. Um, hey, we've got uh, one more on-screen question from, uh, from Curious World STEM Club. Um, and I think it's uh, maybe a, a tag team, uh, Yanni and Angie coming up. So uh, let's get them on screen. We'll get one more live questions for you. And, uh, and then we'll make sure we reiterate all the contest rules and everything. But uh, yeah, you guys are up next. What's your question? Phil. Uh, hello. Um, we're wondering if there's a possibility to make dark green fire or a like dark bright green fire using different chemicals. Absolutely. You can make a very vibrant green fire using something called sodium borate. Now, uh, it's a chemical commonly called borax, which is actually a laundry detergent, believe it or not. So it's a component of, of a laundry detergent and it burns brilliantly green. Um, again, it's not something that you wanna come in contact with because that particular material, it can be very irritating to your skin. So borax is the name of a chemical that will definitely give you a, or sodium borate is the technical name for something that will give you a bright green flame. Yeah, green is one of those elusive colors, right? How do you make that beautiful dark emerald green color? It's it can be tricky, but borax, sodium borate will do that for you. Great question. And another great answer. I don't think anyone's been able to stump Phil yet. And, uh, and so I think we've kind of reached the, uh, the end of our time here. So um, Phil, huge thanks. I guess the last question we have for you, you don't have to give us the, you know, the coordinates or anything like that, but just maybe a yes or no. Do you know where you're watching fireworks this weekend? Do you have your, your plan all ready to go? Oh, yes. I, 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 again, I'm, I'm having fireworks two nights in a row. So my, the city where I live, we've got a little lake fest going on right now, and they do fireworks July 3rd and July 4th. I can see them both from my backyard. That's where I'll be nice and comfortable with plenty of bug spray on because mosquitoes are everywhere. <laughs> Another another uh, you know call for safety out there too, yeah. but um, awesome. Well, hey, thank you so much for some amazing insight. Thanks to all of you. I always feel bad wrapping up. Uh, you know when we don't. Uh, you know we've had so many great questions and we got a little time bound here. That's kind of our binder here. But um, uh, huge thanks to all of you for amazing questions. We're really excited to uh, to see all of your Instagram photos. And so let me put up those instructions here um, so you guys know exactly who to tag to uh, to win a lab coat like Phil's. Uh, come join us in Curious World. STEM club, you know, whether you win the contest or again, check the link on the screen to, uh, to see, you know, how to join. And now we've got, you know, new versions starting every Monday, all summer long. Um, enjoy your holidays. If you're in Canada, happy Canada day to you and enjoy your fireworks tonight. If, uh, if you're here in the States, like a lot of us, uh, enjoy your long weekend coming up and, uh, and enjoy those fireworks and, uh, and make sure you explain to those people, uh, you know, on your blanket or, or wherever you're sitting watching those a little bit about what you learned today and then you have Bill to thank for it. So huge thanks everybody and, uh, and happy 4th of July weekend. Thanks you guys for having me. I had a great time.